Greetings, welcome to Bits and Bytes. This is Pascal, and you're watching Instant Replay, Episode 2. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Instant Replay, where we take a look at games that have either been forgotten or games that really um, are somewhat unknown to us nowadays. Um, today we'll take a look at a game called Gargoyle's Quest 2. Uh, this was released in October of 92 for the NES. Originally, um, Capcom released a game, uh, Gargoyle's Quest, for the original Game Boy. Um, as a child, this was one of the games I grew up with. Um, and I honestly just loved, um, had uh, played through it time and time again. Um, even though it would appear that this would be the sequel to Gargoyle's Quest, um, it turns out it's actually a prequel to the Game Boy game. Not that that really matters a lot. The story is fairly minimal and pretty basic stuff. Um, the two games can be played very independently of each other. Gargoyle's Quest 2 is... Um, in essence, um, a side-scrolling action game uh, with some uh, minimal RPG elements um, infused in it. As we can see here, um, one of the RPG-esque elements of the game is um, traversing villages and towns and interacting with the citizens that live there, engaging in dialogue and uh, searching buildings and such. Not that the dialogue is generally anything worth noting. We'll take a look at that a little bit later. Um, most of it's throwaway stuff and um, unfortunately uh, pretty poorly implemented. Uh, again, more on that later. As we'll see here early in the game, um, it would appear that Firebrand, the main character, is being tasked with retrieving illicit substances of some sort. Perhaps becoming um, a drug dealer, but. Um, this is actually, of course, not the case. Uh, Firebrand, being uh, a gargoyle, does have several interesting moves available to him. Um, we can see that uh, his wings allow him to hover and fly for a limited amount of time. Um, also, again, being a gargoyle, he is able to use his claws to scale the sides of buildings, uh, blocks, and other facades that he comes um, in contact with. He's able to cling on to them to recharge his his uh, wing power he's also able to climb up and down uh, this adds a cool uh, vertical element to a lot of the game's stages and it um, it goes beyond just being simply a left and right side scroller uh, this is the majority of the game uh, where you'll control firebrand in these action sequences between the action sequences, again, we return to the overworld. Um, the story is, like I said, uh, fairly minimal. Um, basically, uh, it is your run-of-the-mill um, RPG story. Firebrand has to save the world, and to do so, he has to advance from one area to the next and usually um, collect an additional power-up item in each area. Um, a, a little bit like uh, perhaps um, Zelda in that regard, but that's about where the similarities end. As a child, one of the things that drew me to this franchise, um, it's, it's still um, kind of cool even today, is the fact that you actually get to control, um, instead of a, your typical hero, a monster. And while he's not um, technically a villain, um, being a monster still comes pretty close to that. The Gargoyles Quest series is also actually part of Capcom's Ghosts and Goblins franchise. Um, I'm not terribly familiar with that. I'm not sure exactly how it ties in together, unfortunately. Now, as the game progresses, um, Firebrand will obtain new items that um, give him new abilities or um, perhaps a, a stronger attack or some such power up. Um, the game uh, lore is pretty much littered with obscure references to uh, to odd-sounding items. 
um, the where well, there we saw the night drop. Um, there's also <laughs> Firebrand will be in charge of finding items like the Spectre's fingernail, uh, the magic buster, the gremlin stick. Um, there is a world there. Unfortunately, it's not ever really explained what the importance or the meaning of most of these items are. In the later stages of the game, uh, the navigation becomes pretty um, intense, as we as we can see. Firebrand will be uh, moving up and across um, large gaps quite frequently, um, and occasionally falling onto a spike trap or into a lava pool causes instant death. Luckily, um, the game does use a password system. Um, as you can see here, unfortunately the password is not given to you upon death. You have to actually uh, seek out a person in a village that will provide you with the password. Uh, if you don't know or somehow miss them, then you will not be given that password and if you turn off the gaming system, uh, there goes your progress. Now one of the nice things about this game is that even after dying, any power-ups that you have previously obtained, uh, Firebrand will continue to have as long as you keep the game system running or happen to come across the uh, password giver and write that password down. Um, you will basically um, have your progress saved for you. Uh, there is no uh, technical game over in the sense of having to start all over. Um, of course, being a, one of, uh, being a Zelda-esque um, I don't want to call it a Zelda clone, but having the Zelda mindset of needing to get additional items. Certain areas are closed off for Firebrand until he gets strong enough to be able to get there. Uh, for example, if his, uh, his jump or wing power is not up to the, the proper uh, level that it needs to be to get across certain areas, he will not be allowed to access them. Now, after leaving the initial village, um, we do see here that Firebrand does then um, traverse basically the world map, and it looks just the same as the village map. Um, while doing so, he's able to find items, um, come into uh, basically random uh, battles with, um, with monsters that also uh, stay on the map in certain places. And to get to um, new towns and to be able to get to his objectives, he'll have to um, occasionally cross uh, little mini levels such as this bridge um, that he uh, where he has to um, show adequate progress in his skills to get past. Now the game seems fairly simple at, at the beginning and there aren't a huge amount of extra abilities that Firebrand can get. However, the level design does get um, uh, quite a lot more complex as the game goes on. Um, Firebrand uh, will need to be able to jump and fly pretty accurately to reach some of the game's um, later level ledges um, and not fall into uh, fall to a, a fiery death. Now we, uh, we uh, mentioned earlier about the uh, dialogue with the characters as you see here. Some of the dialogue is quite laughably silly. Um, Unfortunately, you won't find any deep conversations. Um, however, some of the other monsters littering the games, towns, and villages do have important directions or uh, a quest of sorts to send you on, so uh, you're kind of forced to have to talk to them regardless and endure their banal drivel. Now as Firebrand makes it to the end of um, many of the game stages, he will be facing off in, uh, in little separate rooms, um, a little bit along the lines of a, a Mega Man game, against various bosses. Um, the boss fights are fairly interesting. Um, you will need to use basically all of your um, abilities to be able to be successful here. Um, Firebrand's wings come in quite handy to be able to dodge attacks and get from one place to the next. Alright, that's it for this edition of Instant Replay. Check back with us next time as we take a look at the classic action RPG, Vaxanadu.
check us out at bnbgaming.com and drop us a line. Also make sure to visit us at Facebook forward slash Bits and Bytes Gaming. Let us know if there's a special retro game that you'd like us to cover on a future episode of Instant Replay. This has been Pascal saying thanks for joining us. Until then, goodbye.